Welcome. This is the Doing Diversity in Writing podcast, the show where we as authors explore the better practices of writing inclusively, whether that be in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, class, sexuality, ability, and so on. Why are we here? To bring more depth and breadth to the characters in our fiction and represent them in the best way possible. My name is Bethany A. Tucker, and with me each week is my co-host, Marielle S. Smith. Ready? Let's dive in. So today, Marielle and I have uh, Aaron Olds on. Hey, Aaron, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to read your bio real quick so everyone listening knows who you are. And then we're going to get into this conversation that Marielle and I have been excited to have with you for months, ever since I first told Marielle about your company and some of the books, but we'll get to that. I'm super right. excited. <laughs> awesome. Erin Olds loves to travel, read, and drink boba tea. She currently lives in Seattle, where she homeschools her two excellent children. Erin is the CEO of and editor at Salt and Sage Books, an editing company dedicated to kindness. With a degree in English and French, Erin has worked with authors of all ages her whole adult life. Her poetry and short fiction have been published in various journals and magazines and won a variety of awards. She is a hybrid published author with several indie books out under a pen name and her first traditionally published book, Still a Secret, in progress. So welcome, Erin. Thank you. So I have to admit, um, I cook a lot and how... Do you mind telling us how uh, Salt and Sage, your company, got its name? Of course, I love telling this story. And I actually really like that you mentioned cooking because that is part of the reason. So I kind of need to go back to the very beginning of Salt and Sage. And before, so for me anyway, all of my very best ideas come in like iterations. So I'll get the beginning of an idea and then it turns into something else, which then turns into something else, which then turns into the final product. So that's essentially what happened with Salt and Sage. A good friend and I were talking about potentially making a publishing house, like an LLC for our own self-published works. And uh -huh. we both live in Washington state and I live on the ocean side and she lives on the tumbleweed side is how she describes it. And so we were trying to come up with something that was like both of us together. And I was like, well, what if we did the salt of the ocean? And then she said, and the sage of sagebrush. And I was like, oh, that's beautiful. The alliteration, salt and sage. I like that a lot. So that's where it started. And then the more that we talked about it and the more that I thought about the name as the company evolved, the more I was like, that was a really good choice because it started to be that it reflected both sides of Washington where we live, but it's also, as far as cooking goes, those are both ingredients that you use to enhance a meal. Like you wouldn't ever serve just, here is some salt for your dinner. Here is some <laughs> no. sage to warm, right? They're really good with things. So that has kind of become part of the guiding focus for Salt and Sage is that our editorial approach is very much that we want to enhance what people have already created that is beautiful. We want to add just the right amount of salt and we want to add just the right amount of sage to make things quote unquote taste as good as they possibly can and then on top of all of that um we have like an internal joke that sometimes you need to be a little bit salty and sometimes you need to be a little bit sage so it's a good combo yeah. and then gosh you asked you wanted all the details right yes so the, the final layer of this that i have only just recently been thinking a lot about is that if you look at spirituality in a variety of practices, salt and sage are both used for protection and they're both used for cleansing. Yes. And I'm, yes. really, I'm still thinking about all the implications of that and how it plays into how we run the company. But that's part of it too, is that we really want to make an environment that is um, clean, maybe is the good, right word for it. But like on an energetic level that we hold a lot of space for things to happen. 
We have really good boundaries in salts, if you will. And we try really hard to approach all of our products with a clean slate with, you know, the cleansing abilities of sage. So there I you go. That was a long so answer, much. but that's no, where I love it comes that from. so much. It's almost like as the, as the company uh, developed, you found more layers and it just yes. went deeper and deeper and deeper. That's absolutely how it's felt. Yeah. Yes. So for everyone who doesn't know who Salt and Sage is and what you guys do, um, can you just say what your company does? Oh, yes, of course. I probably should have started with that. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. So we are an editing company. We edit books. Um, we do primarily, we still work with fiction, but we also work with video games and comic book creators and audio creators, uh, people who do podcasts like this one. Uh, so we have, we started with books, but it's expanded just like I mean, that's going to kind of be the theme through this whole thing, as you'll see. We had this little seed of an idea, and it's turned into something a lot bigger. So we edit books. So we have on staff, like, we have your typical developmental editors, line editors, proofreaders, people who are really talented at story and at grammar, and thank goodness at punctuation and things <laughs> like that. That's not my personal forte, so I'm grateful for people who have that skill set. And then... On top of that, we also offer sensitivity reading services. And I think that is what we have become most well known for is the sensitivity reading aspect of it. And I know we're gonna get more into that, but essentially you can send us your manuscript and we can help in a variety of ways. That's definitely what attracted us to ask you to be on the podcast today is we ran across your incomplete guide series and we were like, we want to talk to these people. <laughs> Yeah. Love the incomplete guides. Yeah, we too. So you're so honest that they're incomplete guides. Right? This, this is forever changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no way to write one guide to how to write any person because it's a, it's like trying to write down the story of a living person. They're constantly breathing and moving and growing. Yes. And just since we've mentioned them a couple of times for those who haven't listened to our previous podcast where we mentioned the incomplete guides, do you want to Erin, do you want to tell everyone what the Incomplete series is? A really good question. So after we had been in business for about a year, um, I was doing all of the quality checks on the edits that come back. So I should probably explain a little bit about how the company is set up. So the way that we operate, we describe it as being um, having a moat essentially around our editors and our sensitivity readers. And the way that that looks in practice is that our inbox team are the project managers of all of the projects that come in and authors, clients communicate directly with their project manager. And then the project manager is the one who then discusses things with the editor and takes care of everything. So our clients actually never have direct contact with the editors. And I know that that stresses a lot of people out, but we did it on purpose and we did it with a lot of intent behind it. And so here's the reason is that one thing that we noticed as Salt and Sage was just starting is that a lot of the problems that our editor friends were facing were that they were spending so much of their time on administrative things that it was eating into their ability to do the work that they really loved. It was taking away time that they could be editing and it was honestly burning a lot of them out. And then the closer that I got to the sensitivity reading community and the more that I learned about how all of that worked, um, there were a lot of horror stories that we ran into where clients would essentially use their sensitivity reader as a shield, which is really gross. Please don't do that, anybody who's listening, where essentially they would say, oh, I wrote this book and the sensitivity reader said it was fine. So if you have a problem with it, take it up with the sensitivity reader. No, and, no, no, that is oh, not how it yeah. works. No, no bad, can, gross, do not like. I can see it happen, but yeah, that is not, that's not how that kind of responsibility works, no. Yeah, no, it's, ugh, makes me feel yucky inside even talking about it. So the more people who we talked to and the more that we learned about that, the more we were like, we need a system in place that protects the privacy 
and the emotional energy and the emotional labor of our people. So that's how we have it set up, right? So we're talking about the incomplete guides. I promise I will get back to it. So that's how we have that all set up. And it, it's done very intentionally. So our editors have their privacy and they have as much protection as we can offer them as a company. So as part of that, all of the editorial letters go through a final quality check before they're passed back to the clients. And this is not like a, oh, I'm going to go through and change your words. This is like a, I run a spell check and I make sure that the formatting all lines up and I make sure that it's on official salt and sage letterhead, right? That type of quality check. Um, we're never, we never change what the editors say, just for the record, we never change it. But so as I was going through all of those and I was reading all of these letters back, I realized that I was seeing the same questions being asked and answered again and again and again. And that got me thinking that I wondered if there was a way, because they, we clearly had the readers who we were there, sorry, the authors who we were working with clearly had the same problems that they kept butting up against as far as representation went. So at that point, I thought, well, why don't we just make a really low cost book that will remove any sort of financial barrier and we pay our authors to create it or our editors to create it. And why don't we make that available and just see if it could help because these same questions keep coming up again and again and again. So why don't we make it, why don't we answer these questions in a more upfront way? and kind of take care of the, if you will, the low hanging fruit, the things that people kept having to repeat in their letters back. So that's how it started, was it was a way for us to say, A, we understand that not everybody can afford a sensitivity read because they can be expensive. If, especially if you have a longer manuscript, they can be quite expensive. So we wanted to have a way that lowered uh, the cost of accessibility as far as that went. And then we also wanted to give people a really good boost into starting to write diversely. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. love it. And you, I think you've accomplished that with the guides that you've already um, put out. I have how to write black characters and incomplete guide on my desk right now. Um, well, thank and you. I, that makes me really happy. I planned, I mean, this was how, when we started doing research for this podcast a year and a half ago, because it, it took us almost a year to, to launch and do all of our research. Um, when I started looking to see what kind of resources was out there to help people write diversely, your book, this one I have in my hand right now, How to Write Black Characters, and like two or three others showed up. There's actually not that much on the market, at least when I first did my research 18 months ago. So... You have published several guides though, besides the one I currently have. Do you mind telling everyone what other guides you have? Oh, sure. I would love to. Um, okay, so the guides, we have currently five that are released and we have several more that are in the works. But as I'm sure everybody listening knows, it takes a long time to write a book. So <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> so the books that we currently have out are How to Write Black Characters, How to Write Asexual Characters, how to write autistic characters, how to write fat positivity, and how to write about sexual assault. Those are all really important topics. Yes, and I also love how for, I think, they could look random to people. Um, but these are all things I think that are so relevant, um, especially if you look at what's being written today uh, and where we are. Um, yeah. So is 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 because you you were mentioning uh, you there are some in the works like is is it a secret what's coming out next can you share no. a little bit I would love to tell you so I should say that this the order that I am listing them in is not necessarily the order in which they will be released but okay these are the ones that are on our horizon as we're currently working on the native guide uh, a guide to write queer characters, biracial characters, Japanese-American, Chinese-American, atheist, non-binary, Latinx, 
and then a guide on how to write about disordered eating. Oh, sound amazing. We have like 500 on, okay, 500 is an exaggeration. We have a lot <laughs> listed that we intend to eventually get to, but these are the ones that are coming up the soonest. You will likely see us release the native guide next. I'm excited for that. We just interviewed in our last episode, Grace L. Dillon. Um, she's that the one who- such a good interview, by the way. I really loved listening to it. Oh, you heard it. I mean, I think I did. Am I thinking of the wrong one? Tell no, me. No, you, 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 pro- you probably did. It that was, <laughs> it, it just came out. So I was surprised. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. If it's the one, the one about indigenous futurism, right? Yes. yes. That's the yes. one. Yeah. It was so good. It was really interesting. Yeah. That was a pleasure to do as well. It, it was, yeah. Yeah. That so when you should tell us or tell us what the mailing list is so that we can be apprised of when new ones come out and let our audience know because these are really useful guides and a sensitivity read. And I'm sure we'll, we may come back to this. Um, The cost is like the number one thing that people bring up to me when I'm like, you need a sensitivity reader. And they're like, how am I supposed to pay for that? Shall we, shall we start at the beginning? Like, shall we start at because 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 one of the one of the main reasons we we wanted to talk to you Aaron is because like people do ask about what is sensitivity reading and then of course eventually the question shows up like how about the cost do you want to explain to our audience um, what sensitivity reading is exactly and how it works yes definitely so Sensitivity reading goes by a couple of different names. So you may have heard it as sensitivity reading. You may have heard it as cultural consultations. You may have heard it as cultural reading. Um, All of those are awesome terms and different readers prefer different terms for different reasons. At Salt and Sage Books, we use sensitivity reading, frankly, because it's the most SEO friendly still. And as soon as that changes, we will shift as well. But our goal is to reach as many people as we can. And sensitivity reading is still the term that is used by the broader industry. So I know that some people really don't like the term sensitivity reader, but that's why we've chosen to stick with it. Uh, We do have some of our readers on staff who actually choose to describe themselves in different ways. And of course they can do that. So for instance, if you were to get a read back from one of our editors and on the bottom, it doesn't say sensitivity reader. That's because they've chosen to use a different title for themselves, and that's fine. So we feel like regardless of what you call it, the intention behind sensitivity reading is to say, hey, I have written a book, and in that book is a character who has a life experience that is dissimilar from my own. I would like to make sure that what I wrote is not going to cause real harm to the people of that identity or of that minority or have, who, who have had that experience. Can you please help me? So we do not approach it at all as far as, you know, there's conversation about like censorship and that is not at all what sensitivity reading is. Sensitivity reading is in my mind, the equivalent of if I were to write for instance, a book about space. I am not a scientist. I am an English teacher. So, or I was anyway, but I'm not a scientist. I don't know a lot about space other than what like National Geographic has taught me. So if I were writing a book set in space, I would want to talk to somebody who actually knew a lot about space and to make sure that what I was saying was accurate and that what I was saying is based in real life So for me, sensitivity reading feels less like, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. Will you check and make sure I'm not offensive? It feels more to me like I want to write a character who is real and vivid and who will not do harm. Can you please help me make sure that I have done that? And can you suggest ways to help my character be more nuanced, be more real? That is sensitivity reading. It is checking with somebody who has a lived experience that you do not have so that they can help you make your characters better and your story deeper and the emotional resonance of the story more true. I think that's the best description of what a good sensitivity read is that I have heard. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I thought about it a lot. 
Well, it, it, I think it really sort of, yeah, it kind of sort of sums it all up. Uh, and I really love how you, you spoke about real harm um, and also this fear. And this is something that a lot of writers fear anyway, but like when they start working with an editor, not even a sensitivity reading reader, this fear pops up that an editor is going to change their work like intrinsically. Yeah. Uh, but like what you said, like even when you were describing, like I, I am an editor myself. So when you were just describing how you see salt and sage and that those two are about enhancing that is what I see the job of an editor to begin with um so I love that you take that as well in your your idea of sensitivity reading it's not it's not about censorship it's not about slapping someone on the wrist no it's about bringing out bringing it like making it better Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah we have a joke that I've heard a few of our sensitivity readers say it, so I don't want to give credit to one person and exclude everyone else who I've heard it from. But they have said, if you don't like what a sensitivity reader suggests, then don't do it. It's, (laughs) you don't have to. In the same way that you don't have to take your editorial advice. You can go to a different editor. You can get another sensitivity reader. You can get a second or third or fourth opinion. Those are things you can do. And it's therefore not censorship by any stretch of the imagination because no one's making you do it. Exactly. It's advice. advice. So what is the process? Now that we know what it is, what is the process of of getting a sensitivity rate done with your company? I'm glad you said with my company because I was about to say, well, it might be different for other people, but here's how (laughs) we approach it. Um, we, we have a form on our website that we ask our clients to fill out and that goes to our inbox team. And in that form, we ask you to tell us like, what's the genre of your piece? Uh, what do we need to know about the piece? Is there anyone in particular you're interested in working with? Um, sorry, hang on just a sec. Oh, sorry, I'm back. Um, and we ask, Uh, like what are the content warnings that are involved in this piece basically tell us as much information as you can about your manuscript we want to know so that we can find you the right person then the inbox team goes and they know who is on our staff they know what they can read for and we find you somebody who is a really good fit you can also come in and say hey i would really love to work with this particular person and we have a list of all of our sensitivity readers and editors on the website so you can look through their profiles before you put in that request. But if you don't know who you want to work with, you can just fill out the form and we'll help you find somebody. So we connect you with the sensitivity reader. And then the way that it works on our end with the project manager, the way that we have that set up is that you send your manuscript on the, you know, we take care of contracts and invoicing and all of that. And then you send your manuscript in. If you have any particular questions, we love it when clients send in I'm really worried about this scene, or I'm really concerned about this character, or I've marked some stuff in line. That's all really helpful to do. Um, our favorite is when we get things with inline comments, where the client will say things like, so I wrote this with this intention, but I'm worried that it doesn't ac- come across correctly. Can you help me with this? We love those sorts of things. And when clients ask specific questions so that the editor can make sure to really address what the client's concerns are. The editor then goes through, they read the piece. Obviously, some of our editors read the piece two or three times before they start. It depends. Some editors have different um, approaches to how they go through editing, but they read the manuscript. They will often make inline comments as they go. Some of our editors really love making comments like, like as they read, they react like a reader, right? Like they say, this is hilarious. This made me laugh so hard or like, oh no, or my favorite is when I get a line of like just exclamation points in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened was so good. So you'll get some of that back. So the inline comments come back. Um, and some editors lean more heavily on like, I personally, as an editor, I make a lot of inline comments as I read. Uh, but there are other editors who prefer to put most of their reacting into the um, into the editor's letter. So what you get back from Salt and Sage is you receive back your manuscript, and usually it has some inline comments, and you always get back an editor's letter. And our editor's letters are, I feel a little bit biased saying this, but gosh, they are so good. 
they're so good. Like I, I'm not the only person who does the quality checks anymore because I don't have the time to do everything and that, but it's one of my favorite things is to read through the letters and just see how brilliant the people we have on staff are because they are so good at what they do. And they never try to make authors feel bad. They always try to assume that the author is coming from a place of really good intention. And so then you get back, you get back information in the letter and there are different ways to structure it, which just might be getting a little bit too far in the weeds. But basically you get back a letter that says, here are the things you did really well. Here are the things I would suggest you change. And here is how I think you can change them. We always want our clients to leave feeling like, I know what the problems were. I understand why they were problems. And I know now how to move forward and yeah. adjust my manuscript or polish my manuscript or reconsider this plot point. Yeah, I like I like that because I think a lot of people are afraid, a lot of writers are afraid that, you know, I've seen that fear around like regular editors, but like this fear that it will come back and like, this is what you did wrong. And then that's yeah. it. And that's and not I, useful. I know that edits like that exist. We've yes. heard from authors across the board that edits come back like that. Um, I personally feel a lot of sympathy towards those sensitivity readers because that to me says that the system that is around them is adversarial and not that salt and sage is the magical fix to all things i'm not trying to say that it is but that that is something that we've really tried hard to address is that when sensitivity readers when editors when creators of all types when they feel burnt out it's really hard to um show to approach up. yeah yeah to show up and and to be willing yeah. to do more emotional labor that is really heavy and really hard and to do it in a way that you know you then have to also like think about your tone which yeah. there are a lot of problems with white people myself included in this uh, well I'm not trying to say that I am the I tone police people but that I am a white person and so that I am aware that it is part of my responsibility as a white person to look at the way that I respond, especially to people of color when they tell me that something isn't right, that I have to check myself and make sure that I am not tone policing because that is something that culturally speaking, white people do a lot. And it's one of those things that is part of privilege that's just in the air that I don't know that we're always super aware of it. And it requires us to take several steps outside of ourselves and take stock of, am I approaching this with a lot of my own white privilege and my own white fragility? Yeah, there's an, a, an advantage of getting some of these letters back or critiques back when we have a screen between us and we can be like, oh, that was hard to hear, but we're not face to face. I can go vent in the other room, come back, take a breath and read it again and try to understand. Yes. And, I and think you guys, oh, go you ahead, have sorry. that interface so the author can't just like write back angrily. You can catch that before like a sensitivity reader would have to like experience that backlash. Yeah. And it's sad to me that we need that. Um, I have seen clients come back with so much grace and so much composure. And I absolutely love sending those questions through back to mm. the sensitivity reader. That's something I didn't say initially is that we do have something else built in where like it's built into the cost of the price where you can have a round of questions exchanged with the sensitivity reader, elaborating, you know, explaining, asking questions, those sorts of things. Um, and when the clients come back and they say, this was really hard for me to hear, I want to be sure I understand. Like our readers are so honored by that amount of trust. I'm honored by that amount of trust to say, I can see that we gave you something that was hard and you're sitting with it. And I know that's not easy, but it's really important work to do. It is, it really is.
Have you reached that sweet place where you've written out your entire story? It's a wonderful feeling. You've worked so hard for this, spent so many long hours at the keyboard or talking to yourself via recorder then going over it again at the computer. It's been mostly internal work and it's often been alone. But now it's time to take it from rough to polished. And for that outside perspective is essential. Let me help you. As a developmental editor, I, Bethany A. Tucker, will take your hand, sort through your draft, answer your questions, and help you polish it until your work shines. You don't have to do this alone. It doesn't matter if this is your first book or your 10th book, whether you've published this book already and want to make it better, or you're teetering on the edge, eager to publish for the first time. Together, we can take your book to the next level. Contact me via links in the show notes or at theartandscienceofwords at gmail.com to take the next step. Marielle, do you want to take us out with the next question? Yes, and you already mentioned this, Erin. You were talking about the emotional labor. Yeah. Bethany and I, we obviously agree that sensitivity reading is a service that needs to be paid for, right? Because it's, you know, for us, that's common sense. But what we see a lot um, in discussions online and, and around us is that for various reasons, paying someone to check your work for any incentivities seems to be a hurdle for many authors. It's like one of the main questions that we see pop up. Um, like, why should we be paying someone to do this kind of work? So I'd really love if you could speak a little bit to that emotional labor aspect. Yeah, of, of course. Reading. Well, I obviously agree with you that I think it should be paid and I think it should be paid well. I would say to somebody who is feeling like, well, I shouldn't have to pay for that. I would ask them if they would feel the same about paying somebody who works at NASA. Would you feel the same if you were writing a space opera and you needed, you had questions about rocket fuel? Would you feel that same resistance to paying somebody who works at NASA to take time out of their important job and give you answers? Would you feel that same resistance to paying them for their knowledge? And if your answer is no, then I would suggest that you look a little bit closer at why you feel that resistance towards paying people who have different experiences than you, people with different skin color than you, people who are from different places, have different experiences, have different mental health than you. I would challenge you to look at yourself and ask, why do I feel this resistance around this particular sort of payment? I feel like, especially if you, mm, it's just so, sorry, I, I get kind of emotional about this. It's so important to pay people for their labor. It is so important to do so. And when you look at the systemic things that are in place, that prevent on a systematic level, that prevent, prevent people of color from getting equitable pay, from getting equitable housing, from being able to publish their books. I mean, if you want a really good recent example, go check out the hashtag publishing paid me on Twitter. Oh yes. It was not that long ago, right? Like no. this is happening today, right now. It is not something that we can shrug and say, oh, well, that's over. I shouldn't have to pay anyone. No, it's happening right now. And especially if you are a white author, you, I, we have privilege that is baked into the system. And that if you're not willing to pay people who have been systematically marginalized by that, then this sounds harsh, but you are part of the problem. Please pay your sensitivity readers. Please pay them well. Please don't lowball them. Please go to the Editorial Freelance Association and look at their rates. And if your sensitivity reader is charging less than those rates, you should pay them more. Especially, a lot of times, okay. Yeah, a lot of times people in these positions don't even know what they should be getting paid. And they therefore get taken advantage of. I have big feelings about that too. We could honestly have an entire hour long conversation about uh, payment of editors. I've, I've got a lot of big feelings about that. But I, I mean, yeah, uh, I have strong feelings about it. My husband is a black man in tech 
and I could go on for at least an hour on payment and discrimination in that industry. So it transfers. The disparity is truly astonishing. And I knew it was bad before I started Salt and Sage. But the more that I have talked to our editors, the more I have seen, for instance, I won't name names because this, I won't. Um, but we have had editors who have reported that big publishing houses have offered to pay them like $200 to read an 80,000 word manuscript, which like, uh, no, are you? Oh, no, it may, like it makes my heart hurt. That is nothing. That is nothing. Yeah. So I understand yeah. that it's expensive, but I would really say it is worth saving for, just like you would save to hire a really good developmental editor. You should save to hire a really good sensitivity reader. It's important. It deserves yeah. to be well paid. Yeah. yeah. You know what? You're talking about the $200 uh, uh, for, for a novel read. And I see that. I see that when people are offering like a beta reading, they're like, they charge like $200, $250 for a novel. And I, I remember once having a discussion with a client who had published her book. And then due to the reviews she was getting, she decided to pull the book down, gave it to me for a developmental edit. And I noticed how badly it was proofread. So I mentioned that to her and she said, well, it's ridiculous, right? Like I paid, I paid um, $80 for this and this is the quality I got. And so this was a 50,000 word novel. I told her like, just basing on how many words I can process in an hour when I do a proofread, I was like this, so this is what the person made. And it was like, well, I can't remember exactly, but I, I made this calculation. And so the author was like, I never thought of it like that because I don't know how long it takes to do this kind of work. But she thought $80 was a lot of money for a proofread for 50,000 words. And I'm like, no, if you pay somebody $80 to proofread something like that, yeah, it's no wonder it's full of mistakes because nobody can like, read that fast and fix it. Yeah, it's like cents per the hour at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I yes, paid I over yeah. $800 just for the proofreading of my last book. That sounds pretty on market to me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But this is the yeah. thing. It's like, I think also that a lot of authors, uh, especially indie authors, um, you know, there is the money, there, there is, there is the money issue, but it's also, I think sometimes a lack of knowing how long these things take. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's a good question. So, and frame this however you want, but what kind of sensitivity reading requests do you most often get? This is a fun question. So it comes in waves is what we've noticed. So we will get, for instance, a large amount of requests for Japanese American readers. At one point, our Japanese American readers were like booked back to back for like six to eight months out. And then it kind of slows down. So it comes in waves, it changes, uh, but most recently what we've seen a real uptick in is we have had a lot of requests for Black characters. We've seen a lot of requests for queer characters across the LGBTQIA plus spectrum, um, particularly an emphasis on trans women. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of call for autistic characters and a lot of call for Indigenous representation as well. Most recently, I mean, genuinely, it changes. If you asked me in a month, I would have a different answer. But that's presently where we are. It's it's interesting how, and, and I'm not surprised at all by that. Is that it? It reflects kind of what what happens in society. Yeah, like the discussions that we're having in the society. So it, that makes people, I think, more aware of certain things. So they become more sensitive towards writing these kind of characters or maybe this is why they want to include these kind of characters so now they need a sensitivity reader i think that there's definitely a correlation so could you name um one or two authors who you think do diversity well in their writing and if so um do you have any specific works in mind by them 
Yes, I do. Okay. So we could also probably talk for an entire hour about this. <laughs> I was like, just, just, just your tone. I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> so I would say, first of all, the authors who do diversity very best are obviously the authors who are diverse themselves. So when I, cause you sent me the questions before and said, we were going to talk about this. And I was like, Oh, how do I narrow that down? Because I have a lot of books we could talk about. So I decided to pick the last three that I read that I really just adored. So here they are. Uh, the ghost squad by Claribel Ortega. It's a middle grade and it is so fun. It has become one of my, like I have, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. And so that is one that is now on my, this is a book to purchase for my nieces and nephews for their birthdays. One, Ghost Squad. It's so good. Uh, yeah. Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas, like broke my heart and then stitched it back together. It was so good. That one features a, um, a trans character and it's just so wonderful. And there are ghosts and it's beautiful. And there's a cemetery, obviously. And I just loved it. It was so good. Um, and then the one that I am almost finished with, so I can't yet tell you how it ends, but like I am riveted, is Iron Widow. And I'm going to do my very best to pronounce their name correctly. It's Shiran J. Shao. Zhao, I believe. Yeah, Shiran J. Zhao. Yeah. Yeah. So Sorry, I took Chinese is... in college. Oh, yes, please help me. I I am a big fan of them. They have a really cool YouTube channel. And I'm always so... I want to try to pronounce your name correctly, but I know I'm white. Uh, you uh, got really close and I don't see the markings on the pinion here, so I can't do the tones for you. <laughs> okay. Well, they're remarkable though. So definitely go check that book out. It's a lot of fun. It's called Iron Widow. And then as far as authors who use sensitivity readers, it's hard to say because a lot of them don't come out publicly and say, I want to thank my sensitivity readers for helping me with this book. But I do know of two who I read regularly that I wanted to recommend. They are both indie authors. Uh, the one is Penny Reed, which anybody who is involved in any amount of romance novel reading will probably know Penny Reed. Um, she's really impressive. I like her books a lot. And she's written several really interesting blog posts about her experience working with sensitivity readers. So if you have not read those, I would recommend that you check them out. And I also, Penny Reed stuff is a lot of fun. And then the other reader who, or the other author who I really like is named Fiona West. And uh, she's pretty open about the fact that she uses sensitivity readers. And I'm actually in the middle of reading one of her books. The hero of this romance is dyslexic and also has, um, I believe it's called hypergraphia where his handwriting is really difficult to read. But the way that Fiona weaves those details into the story, I just feel like is really expertly done. And she's got, her other books feature things like, um, like immigration and she has autistic characters. And like, she's not afraid to like wrestle with hard topics while also letting her people fall in love which is my favorite combination. That so her sounds name's like a combination Fiona I West. would read. <laughs> yeah. She's, I really like her. I like her a lot. I like her as a person. I like her as an author. I'm a fan. Okay, so I'm definitely including those uh, in the show notes as well for our uh, listeners to check out. Because uh, this is the thing, right? Like you want to have examples of people who are doing it well, because by reading their books, we learn a lot about how we can implement it in our own books. Definitely. Yeah, that, that is a challenge because I grew up in a very insular community and then it wasn't until I reached university that I got to know a lot more different kinds of people and we often don't know what we don't know and we, if we haven't spent time educating ourselves, we don't, we, we don't recognize what good is <laughs> until we get introduced yes. to it. Well, that exactly what you just said, we don't know what we don't know. I feel like that is like the goal of sensitivity reading is to say, I know you probably don't know this. Here's more information. And now that you have this additional information, you can write better characters. Yeah, exactly. And that's part of what I love the incomplete guides for, because I would, I would tell people read these first 
before you go anywhere because you're going to give the sensitivity your sensitivity reader such a better foundation if you've already covered this yourself and you won't have to rewrite as much if you get like some of the basics in there from the start of planning your story yes yes it's heartbreaking when an author comes and says I have this whole concept I've written this whole novel it's 120,000 words and then the sensitivity reader comes back and has to say I know you spent so much time and work on this but I need we need to address something that is at the core of your story yeah, and I like still. that, oh, I've had to do that. I've had to do that. And it, it's really, that was one of the hardest editing letters I've ever written where I'm like, the core of your story is actually kind of destructive to the community that you want to be writing about. So, yeah. Yeah. But you do your best. <laughs> yes. Well, and that is- I mean, it's a, it's a hard lesson to learn, but it's a lesson that once you've learned it, you're not likely to forget it. No, no, you only do it once if you can. (laughs) Yeah. And I do think that is the stuff, like nobody said that writing was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially wanting to be a good writer. I think nobody said that was going to be easy. Uh, Apparently not. (laughs) On that note, I think it's important to note too that you can get sensitivity reads at lots of different points in the process of your book, but we've recently seen an uptick in people actually sending in like their their synopsis, like their outline before they've even started reading. And I love that so much. Oh, yeah. Cause then we can address things before you have spent, you know, hours, months, sometimes writing these things out and getting them as perfect as you can, that we can address the stuff in the beginning. Yeah, I do. So that you don't I have do to take that time. Yeah, I, I have that. I, I offer my um, outline critiques um, as one of my services. And I see that too, and people specifically asking, um, because I like they know my background uh, in, in gender studies, post-colonial theory and stuff like that. So they know who I am and they know what I know. So they will also ask me questions like, you know, I, I've outlined this novel, um, but there are these characters and I just want to make sure that the plot, the way I set up the plot and the way I intend to uh, have these characters interact doesn't do anything that might be problematic. It's such a uh, self-aware way to approach yes. writing. Yeah, and I love it because like you said at the beginning, um, is that you know, when, when people come to you, when people come to Salt and Sage, like you assume their best intention. And I would say that, yes, if people have saved up to do, uh, to, to actually pay and pay a sensitivity reader well, they must have good intention. Yeah. Um, but the same with like, I would I, say I, yeah. by and large, yeah, by and large, yeah. people really do have their best intentions. Yeah. They so do. for me, it's, yeah, for me, it's always like, if people are asking the question, that is already such a big step because that says a lot about where they are and what they're willing to learn. I have a practical question about, um, you said Salt and Sage is getting more uh, requests for sensitivity reads on outlines. What if someone's a pantser? Can they still send in like a concept? Ooh, that's such a good question. Okay, I'm a pantser or I'm a recovering answer I don't know how to phrase it anymore no same Um, yeah same I am I was a pantser until about eight years ago and then I was like no we're not doing this anymore but some people legitimately that's how they do it yeah Yeah. um yes send in concepts send in ideas I think that's great honestly as far as like sending stuff in early I think you can send in whatever you have And another thing that, um, this isn't something Salt and Sage offers, but I have a friend who offers it. So I'm going to plug her. Um, Her name is Sachiko and she is Japanese American and she's fabulous. And she's a really, really talented storyteller. And I hire her to listen to my pitches for my books in advance. And she helps me with world building. So you can find people who do that. You can find people who are like, hey, I would love to hear you tell me about this story. So like, I don't even have stuff written down in the beginning because it's all just sort of nebulous in my mind because that's how my brain likes to write for some stressful reason. And 
it's amazing to just be able to talk it out. And then she just asks me questions and we get really clear. And then she'll say, that seems concerning to me because of, I'm like, oh, you're right. That doesn't make very much sense. Let's, you know, let's fix that. Yeah. So she's now part of my pre-writing process is hiring her and having her help me through, like help me to think through all of the pieces. I absolutely adore that. I mean, I did, you, you know, I do that sometimes with clients or have I never told you? Maybe I haven't. No, no, you haven't told me. I mean, I used to do this to my mom when I was a teenager while we were washing dishes. I'd be like saying the story out loud. And then I would be like, oh, that's a massive plot hole here. Let me rinse, the, rinse this plate while I figure out what the heck I did. I love that yeah. image of you yeah. rinsing the plate and being like, darn it, that's not going to work. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that, but that's, that's my process. Yeah. I need to do yeah. something with my hands when I have a plot problem. So I'll go wash dishes until I figure it out. Yeah. Love it. I clean the yeah, bathroom. But Erin, but I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely gonna leave uh, your, your friend's uh, name and link in the show notes as well. If, if that's, if that's okay with you. Yeah, of course. Because you can, she actually, she works for Salt and Sage books as well. So you can just, you can request to work with her directly through Salt and Sage, and then we can connect you to her for that particular service that we don't offer but she does what what would yeah. someone contacting you for that service what would they call it uh Magico's world building magic soup I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I heard you talk about Sajiko on the podcast I would like to work with her help that would that would work that would work yeah, all right that, that's clear that okay. Would work. La okay last question um what would your advice be to anyone wanting to write more diverse characters? I love this question. I have so many answers, so I'm going to try to uh, boil it down. Uh, number one, read diverse books. Read diverse books, yes. especially if you have a character in mind. You're like, this character is a Black character. Okay, so then please also tell me you are reading books written by Black authors. You are consuming TikToks made by black creators you are listening to podcasts by black creators you are watching youtube videos by black creators there is so much content available read the books listen to the podcasts and learn by osmosis you will learn so much just by sitting and listening there is so much wealth to be found in that um next i would say really look closely at why you need this particular character to be this particular identity in your story. That's a question that comes up a lot in the sensitivity reads back where our editors will say like, why is it that this character needs to be autistic? Why is it that this character needs to be Japanese American? Why do they need to be bisexual? And it's not to say that you absolutely have to have like a, oh, well, they have to be this because then this one experience only happens to people of this particular group. That's not what it is. It's to say that they are, rather, it is acknowledging the fact that who you are, what your identity is, shapes who you are as a person. So if your character is bisexual, I'm bisexual, so I feel like I can talk about this one. If your character is bisexual, the way that they approach dating, for instance, is going to be different than someone who is straight. It is a different experience because they are different people. So why is it that you need your character to, to have that particular identity? I would get really clear on that. And that's also a really good way to check yourself and make sure that you're not accidentally introducing stereotypes into your book. Because yeah. for instance, if you're saying, oh, I want this person to be Japanese American because they're really like humble and shy. Like that's a stereotype, thanks. Let's, let's deconstruct that, right? Like that's not, you wanna make sure that you are not putting, plugging people in just to serve as stereotypes. And then the last thing is I would just encourage you to write joyful characters. Um, we see a lot of stories come through where people are writing about Okay, I want to be sure to phrase this like really precisely. They're writing about the trauma that they assume yeah. that person would go through. Mm. And it is often 
harmful. It's often not based in fact, it's often stereotypical and it's often really problematic. So if you are writing a story, say about an autistic character and that autistic character's whole point in your book is to prove how hard autistic people have it and you are not autistic, you should maybe not be writing that story because it's yeah. not yours to tell. You do not know what it is like to be an autistic person. So don't write what it's like to be an autistic person. You can still include autistic characters. You can have them falling in love. You can have a sibling who is an autistic character. You can have, I don't know, someone who works at a, your ice cream store. If you're writing an ice cream middle grade, I have no idea. I'm making this up as they go. But like you can have people be a variety of identities doing a variety of things because that's what real life actually looks like. And so I would really caution against writing about trauma that is not yours. Yeah. yeah. And I would say that if you want to practice writing diversely, a really good entry point is to write those characters with a lot of joy in their lives. Write them being that. happy. Write them having good, full, real lives because guess what? They do in real life have good, full, real lives. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that we've talked about, um, I think, especially in season one, um, that the, the pitfall that we see or the trap that people sort of, you know, fall into is that when you introduce, let's say, a, a queer character, you know, their particular character arc is about being queer. Uh, While, uh -huh. you know, you can, like, every every character, like, every, mo the most important characters, they all need their own character arcs, right? Because they all think that the story is about them. Yeah. But you often see these characters reduced to what makes them different. Exactly and that. Yeah, and like you said as well, it's like there is such a difference between writing about a particular struggle as somebody who doesn't have that struggle. Maybe that's not the voice that you should claim, right? Maybe that is um, that. May maybe you should leave that to those who actually know what the struggle is firsthand. But that doesn't mean you cannot include characters who have these identities. But you can include. You can, and this is a great point you make you know, like newsflash, you can include these characters without these struggles. Yeah. Yep. And it's not to say that you can't write them without the struggles. You're, ooh, I'm going to plug another book. Let me find the title of it really quickly. No, I know it. It's called Have Geek Will Travel. And it's by <laughs> Rebecca Blevins. It's- I love the title. The it made me laugh. Me too. It is, it's a romance. And Rebecca is autistic. And the male, uh, what do you call it? The hero of the story, the male love interest is autistic. And that book talks about what it is like for him to be autistic. And he is allowed to have other interests. He has a very yeah. full life. He has this girl who he's totally head over heels with and really wants to kiss. And right, like he's a person. He's mm -hmm. not just, oh, and then here's our autistic yeah. standard. So that book is excellent. It's Have Geek, Will Travel by Rebecca Blevins. Um, I love it. Yeah. Like you can have, you they can still struggle as side characters with yeah. things that are specific to their identity, but it doesn't have to be what defines them as people. That yeah, that's the point I was trying to make. Not like, don't talk about the struggle because it does define them. It makes them who they are. So every well-developed character, it will be part of who they are because it has made them who they are, but it doesn't have to be at the forefront um, yeah, of, of who they are. Yeah, Giving, giving yeah. all of these characters permission to be human first and identity yes. second. And to, I love what you said, let them, let them be joyful let them be happy um that's not the exact word you used but in that i really appreciate that you brought that up but yeah i think, I think it's really really oh, solid sorry. advice no i was gonna say like that is uh, i haven't heard that one before 
And I actually love it because, yeah, we do. And this, you mentioned uh, Clary Bello Vega and her ghost squad. Yeah. And I, I follow her on, on Instagram. Um, we talked about her uh, in a previous episode when she comments on the fact that it's really hard. One of the reasons it's hard for people of color to get published, like Black, Indigenous and people of color, because publishers are also saying, oh, where's the hurt? Where's the trauma? As if they're not allowed to yeah. write about, you know, themselves and their community members as, as joyful, happy people, as if that is not the narrative that we're ready for or something. So I'm, I'm glad, really glad you mentioned that specifically. Yeah. So we are definitely coming up on an hour. And Erin, yes. this has been an absolutely fantastic interview. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I have really liked talking with the both of you. Would you remind everyone one more time how someone can choose to work with you and your editors and sensitivity readers and also where they can find these incomplete guides? Absolutely. So uh, let's start with the incomplete guides because that's a shorter answer. You can find them on Amazon, but they are also available at basically any bookstore that you can find if they have access to Ingram Spark, you can ask your local bookstore to order them directly. Uh, but Amazon is, you know, the great the floating castle in the sky of ease. Yes. <laughs> it is very easy to access it via Amazon. Uh, and we've got, they're all out in ebook format and you can also buy them um, in paperback as well. As far as working with Salt and Sage, you can just go to our website. It's saltandsagebooks.com. You can find us on basically every social media except TikTok. We're working on it. And if you just look up Salt and Sage Books, you'll find us. Uh, but yeah, the website is the very best way to see what we're about, see who our sensitivity readers are, and to put in a request for a consult. Awesome. Will, yeah, I'm going to put all those links in the show notes for those listening so they can easily find you. All right. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Music for this show was written and produced by Eric Mills. If you found this episode helpful, please rate and review on your favorite podcast app and spread the word so other writers can find us too. To get our Doing Diversity in Writing Toolkit, which includes all bonus material from season one, go to representationmatters.art. That's dot A-R-T. Here you will also find our episode show notes. Happy writing and see you next episode.